Let's talk about the defense attorney. I could say a whole lot about the defense attorney since that's where I spent most of my career as a defense attorney. Uh, but I'll keep it, I'll keep it minimal. Uh, so the defense attorney is the counterpart of the prosecuting attorney. What do you think the role of the defense attorney is? To get the defendant off? like on television, do the do whatever they must do to get the defendant off, whether that means like hide ev evidence or lie or do really shady things? The answer is no, because the defense attorney is an officer of the court, meaning their role is I'm an officer of the court first, defense attorney second. They have to uphold the integrity of the legal process, just like the prosecutor. And when I am asked about whether or not, you know, that's my job, or would you try and get the defendant off, I get asked that all the time. My response is, I say, I make sure that their rights are not being violated. And I have to determine whether or not the prosecutor has a case against my client. That's my job. My job isn't to get them off. It is to make sure rights aren't being violated and to determine that the prosecution actually has a case. You might get a different uh, statement from a different defense attorney, but those are my, my goals. So, and a very, well, before I move on, a very important concept with defense counsel is that the defendant, the accused, has an absolute constitutional right to have counsel, competent counsel, not just any counsel, not just one to sit there at the table uh, with the defendant, but competent counsel. And we'll talk about what competent means in a little bit. Every criminal defendant is entitled to counsel in a criminal trial. And the reason behind this is when somebody's liberty is at stake, right? We have liberty. We have the right to be free and not be incarcerated. When somebody's liberty is at stake and they cannot afford an attorney, the government must provide one. And we discussed Gideon versus Wainwright in the, in the police uh, section when I was talking about the Miranda warnings. The Sixth Amendment created this framework and that Gideon case now uh, indicates that the um, defendant is entitled to a, an attorney at every stage of a case. Every stage. doesn't mean when you're arrested moving forward. It could be being interviewed, being inter interrogated. You don't even have to be charged. It attaches when somebody is in custody. Now, the book mentions there are at some times where the defense attorney is not uh, mandated um, by law. Parole, things involving parole violations or um, trying to be somebody who is incarcerated in the Department, uh, Department of Corrections or yeah, in prison. And they want to be paroled and they're denied. Um, not necessarily entitled under the Constitution. And... Um, in New York state has allowed that in parole, but it's, it's, it's state by state law. It's not a, a, con a uh, state, uh, it's not a federal constitutional uh, requirement. And after sentencing, not entitled uh, those after sentence motions that we call them post conviction motions, that not entitled to counsel relative to those. So now my question is, does this mean the attorney is free? It's free. The attorney works for free. No, a lot of people have that misconception. The attorney is paid by the, the government, whether it's the federal government who did the appointment or the state government. So defense attorney is still paid. And I will say at a lower rate than a private attorney. And we'll talk about the difference shortly. So where do these attorneys come from? The appointed attorneys. There's three categories, 
for legal services for the indigent, as they call them, public defender's office. That's the common. Most people uh, understand the public defender and what that is. It's a just it's the opposite of the DA's office. It's it has a head public defender who, by the way, is appointed, not not uh, elected, and they have a staff of other public defenders, and they handle just criminal cases. In another uh, another place where we find uh, assigned counsel or these public defenders, uh, folks who represent defendants uh, who are appointed from the uh, government or from the court, are assigned counsel. These are lawyers within the community that are on a, a panel or a list and the court just designates an attorney from that assigned counsel list to represent them. This is fairly big in the North Country. Um, actually, up until the beginning of the year, um, beginning of last year, Clinton County never had a public defender's office and folks were primarily assigned, attorneys in the area were primarily assigned as assigned counsel. There's always an assigned counsel uh, program in uh, counties and in the federal system because a public defender may not be able to represent an individual due to a conflict of interest. And when there's more than one person who's been charged and there's co-defendants, they can only handle one case due to a conflict of interest. So they would be assigned out to assigned counsel. So that is a very common practice, uh, having assigned counsel. And then there are contracts systems where um, counties or states or the federal system contracts with specific attorneys to take uh, cases. That's a contract system. So that is where you find attorneys um, to represent the indigent. But you can find the private bar if an attorney can afford their own. Some defendants will hire attorneys at their own expense, and they're free to do that, even after being appointed an attorney. Family members will contribute, and these would be attorneys who actually specialize in criminal law and taking cases as part of their practice. I did both, assigned counsel and the private, the private bar. Uh, you see this with very highly publicized cases. Most defendants are represented by assigned counsel or a public defender's office and um, it can be quite expensive to have to hire your own the threshold of having a, a defense attorney assigned is quite low they have to meet a certain you know a certain standard of living and that threshold is in for the federal system if you, the, the way they calculate it, family of four or one person with three dependents making less than $24,000. No, actually a little bit higher. That was a couple years ago. I, a couple years ago it was $24,000. Every year it goes up a, a niche, but we're looking at a very low threshold. Um, the state has its own threshold, which is a lot lower than the federal threshold. So, does the type of lawyer matter? If you have a public defender, or you hire it. There are pros and cons to having a public attorney versus a private attorney. Technically, the answer should be no, because all attorneys have to, all defense attorneys have to be competent, competent attorneys, whether you're public or private. But public defenders offices, like prosecutors, they have tons and tons of cases. And they they're just assigned you know another file another case not necessarily another person was how it's supposed to be how you're supposed to look at your your client it just to them is another another case and there's also some stigma that comes along with paying and not paying for your representation a lot of people think if i'm not paying for it i'm not going to get good representation uh and these are just beliefs and a lot of them are very untrue very untrue i the, the statistics show differently but work you know working at a public 
defender's office when that's all they do they're very good at it they might not be or you know warm and fuzzy and it, and it may not appear as being uh individually taken care of but they are very knowledgeable and very good at what they do because that's all they do private attorneys may do other areas of law besides criminal law and like I said, the statistics, the statistics show differently. Check out page one, uh, 180. Conviction rates are the same, regardless who represents you. Uh, whether it's state or federal, doesn't matter. There has been, uh, the statistics show that publicly represented are incarcerated at a higher rate than those who pay their attorney. But that doesn't mean it's based on the attorney. It could be a whole lot of other uh, reasons. Uh, somebody who's paying attorney has resources. Their backgrounds might be different. They might have stable positions. They might play a different, you know, there's a different kind of role that a court is looking at when sentencing somebody. Uh, so it's not just about, oh, I got a public attorney or a private attorney and public attorneys go to jail more often. Um, but despite that publicly represented, uh, they're incarcerated at a higher rate, their lengths of sentences are much shorter um, when it's publicly, a publicly paid uh, public attorney versus a paid attorney. So, but like I said, there's a lot more that goes into this than being paid or not paid. Public attorneys are more experienced. They know the courts, they know the DAs, because that's what they that's what they're used to working with. Also, the federal court system and sentencing structure is very structured. It, it, they have a, a sentencing guidelines that have to be followed with the type of crime. So it's very hard to kind of weave in and out of that, whether you're paid, whether an attorney is paid or public. So I pose to you, do you think someone accused of a crime should get free representation? What do you think? of the lawyer who represents someone for the most hyenas crime, like Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building, or the men who were responsible for the Boston Marathon bombing. They're entitled to representation, competent representation. But what do you think? Now I said competent representation. Let's talk about this. The defendant is entitled to competent representation or a competent attorney, meaning effective assistance of counsel. So for example, a defense attorney can't fall asleep during trial, right? That's a big, that's a big no-no for everybody. Uh, defendants who claim that their counsel was ineffective in representing them, though, I'm going to tell you they have a big hurdle to meet. Even if the attorney dozed off through some of the prosecutor's cross-examination of one witness, isn't going to be enough. And the court case that gives us the, the law on effectiveness at the federal level, the, the, each state has a different level. New York actually has a stricter, uh, a stricter structure, which makes it harder to get uh, uh, a successful overturn of a conviction based on ineffective assistance to counsel. But the federal one is what we are going to deal with, the Strickland versus Washington. It's a created, um, they created a two-pronged test for determining when counsel is uh, ineffective or effective. And that standard is that the performance was so deficient that the errors essentially eliminated the presence of counsel at all, like counsel wasn't even there. So if counsel sleeps through the entire trial, then there's a good chance of the defendant being successful, right? Here's our two-part test here up on the screen. Uh, that because of the deficiency, the defendant was prejudiced to the extent that they didn't receive a fair trial. So the likely outcome would have been not guilty. And this is a very, subjective view 
um, even if counsel didn't file a motion. I, I can give you a whole litany of examples of what defendants say after they're convicted about their defense attorneys. They didn't file this particular motion and they should have. And not filing a motion isn't going to be a win if the motion was something that they couldn't have won to begin with. Um, the court is looking for combinations. Was there a combination of errors that can lead to the in ineffectiveness, the failure to cross-examine a witness, the, the failure to ask for a favorable jury instruction, whether the defense counsel actually admitted that the client was guilty in a closing argument? Uh, you know, it's hard, hard, it's a hard standard to meet and to win. Um, there can be one overall uh, issue um, where, you know, maybe the counsel didn't file the motion for uh, a determination whether the police conducted an illegal search and seizure. And if the, if it's extremely obvious that that issue was in play and the council didn't, that could be deemed ineffective. There, it's been deemed ineffective where the attorney did not cross-examine a state investigator at, at all, and the state investigator had some integrity issues um, where he could have attacked the credi you know, credibility. Anyway, it's a very hard test. But it is there. You need to know that defense attorneys have to be competent. And what happens if the defense attorney is deemed ineffective? What happens? What do you think happens? And this usually happens. This is an argument on appeal, by the way. This is when this, go, this, when this comes into play, on appeal to the appellate court. The case gets overturned, and it goes back for a new trial with a new lawyer if the if uh, the case is overturned due to incompetence, they're not going to have the same attorney. Uh, there'll be a requirement that the defendant gets assigned another attorney, and they do it all over again. So does a defense attorney have to do every single thing his or her client tells him or asks of him? I have clients who send me all sorts of letters and their Google research and, uh, you know, I want you to do this and make this motion and, and I read about this and you need to do that. Um, yeah, an attorney is not a puppet. The attorney is the one that's understood to have the experience and the education to get a case from beginning to end. And the lawyer's choice regarding strategic purposes, like what motions get made, what witnesses get called to the stand, what questions get asked, how does the cross-examination going to go, uh, those are all lawyer's decisions. Strategic planning is the lawyer. So the answer is no. They do not have to listen to everything their client tells or asks. However, there are four absolute rights that a defendant has that no attorney can overrule or trump. If they disagree, they disagree, but it's completely the defendant. That's whether or not they want to take a plea or plead guilty, take a plea bargain or have a trial. Whether or not they wish to have their case heard by a jury or a judge, bench trial or a jury trial whether or not they wish to testify on their own behalf. Remember, they have the right to remain silent and they don't have to say anything. And if they want to say something, the defense attorney can't go, oh God, no, don't say that because that's, you know, you're not gonna take the stand, can't do that. If the defendant wants to testify, defense attorney has to step out of the way and let it happen. And they have the right to appeal. That is, those are the four rights that they have that over, tr that trumps over their defense attorney's advice. All right, so do you think it's easier to be a defense attorney than a prosecutor? What do you think? I'm just going to, I'm just posing the question. We're not going to answer it one way or the other. I've been, I've been both. <laughs> Pros and cons, we've talked about them. 
All right, defense attorney, let's talk about court administration. This will be a fairly short because I think the book covers this very, very well. Each court system, the federal and the state, they each have their court administration that governs the rules and the procedures of the court. And uh, the New York court administration is in Albany, the state capital, that oversees the management of the New York state court system. The administrative office for the federal courts was created in 1939, as you can see. And um, both are are growing. Um, the budgets are quite large, but they also do a lot of overseeing of timeliness of cases and making sure cases get done effectively. They don't linger around for, well, criminal cases have a lot shorter time frame due to speedy trial rights, but civil cases can linger for years, even decades. Um, they also see the personnel of all the courts in the, in the state. So technology, it's certainly so slow going. The federal system seems to have a grasp on advanced technology systems that are, that are used. Um, the, you know, the book explains these, they have case management, uh, systems they have a way of documenting you know the evidence that's presented in in trials um, sharing of information amongst their courts i mean we don't even have in some courts there's filing where attorneys can file documents and motions and such and here and in a lot when i say here plattsburgh clinton county no, the north country um it was very, we did not accept it. There was a lot of courts that didn't accept anything, briefings or filings or anything. You had to hand deliver them or mail them in the mail. Once the coronavirus uh, kind of put everything to a halt, they learned very quickly how to accept things via email and through um, databases and such. So we've, we took a very big leap into techno technology advances as of March of 2020 that didn't exist the month before. And the other thing that has been impl implemented more commonly is video conferencing. Courts were shut down and it took almost two months for them to even, oh, let's try Zoom or Skype uh, or some sort of video conferencing amongst attorneys which is fine in civil cases, but there's a lot of problems in criminal, uh, in the criminal proceedings because the Constitution dictates um, the rights of the defendant. The, right, the defendant has a right to stand in an open court with the judge present and be sentenced and accept a plea and get a jury trial. They're not doing jury trials via Zoom. Actually, there's no jury trials going on. There hasn't been since March. So now the speedy trial constitutional issue is in play. But they're slowly opening the door to taking certain types of testimony via video conference, but it is extremely uh, hard to do uh, in criminal proceedings unless there are some changes in the in the Constitution because the defendant is entitled to a lot of rights and one of those rights is to be present in court and the question will be whether or not being present in court is standing behind a video screen with the courtroom on the other side of the video screen so with that that ends this chapter's uh, lecture and we'll be switching on talking about trials and, and pretrial hearings next